welcome to today's event, Gender Mainstreaming in the Private Sector. Today's event is part of the Women Energize Women um, campaign. It's a communication initiative of the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Protection and implemented by Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit and the German Renewable Energy Federation within the scope of the ministry's global project bilateral energy partnerships and dialogues. The campaign really aims to empower, inform and connect women in the energy sector across the world through different formats, events like this one, by sharing the stories of inspiring role models, just as the story our guest that is here today will have to share with you. And of course, by promoting knowledge sharing in the energy sector amongst women. A couple of quick notes of housekeeping. As I just said, we I would love to hear from you today as well. We have the chat open for you throughout the event, and you can use this for different purposes. Obviously, if you have any technical issues, please feel free to let us know in the chat, and I myself and my colleagues would be happy to help you. But also feel free to use it to network, so you can follow the example of fellow participants like Zainab, who already put in the chat who she is and what she's doing, you can feel free to use it to introduce yourself, to share links about your work and to comment on today's discussion. Today is going to focus on the topic of gender mainstreaming in the energy sector. Gender mainstreaming is one of the tools that we have designed to correct the imbalance between men and women and the opportunities that they have in their career paths. So it really aims to increase gender equality in different levels on the institutional and the public level, as well as in the private sector and commercial level. And there are many com companies that are already working with gender mainstreaming in their business model. Today, we're going to focus on one particular example, Solar Sisters. So I get to speak today to Catherine Lucy and to learn more about the motivation behind her work, to learn more about how Solar Sister works with the model of gender mainstreaming in order to empower other women in the energy sector and, yeah, learn how they uh, are changing the status quo. It's really great to have you here with us today, Catherine. Thanks so much for joining in this session. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's really a delight to be here and I'm looking forward to this conversation. So Catherine, um, I think you, like I said in the introduction, are really one of these role models who are changing the status quo, who have built up organizations that are really setting uh, a different kind of path and opening so many opportunities. So I'm really looking forward to learning more about how you're doing that at Solar Sisters. Um, again, a quick reminder that we're happy to receive questions and comments in the chat throughout. I'm looking forward now to having this moderated interview with you for about 30 minutes before we open the floor also for for others to come in with their audio and video to share their questions and comments. So I would love to start our conversation off by just learning a bit about more about you and your career path and where you got, um, how you got to where you are today. So um, I'd like to go all the way back, sort of, I didn't share so much about your biography, but to sort of start how you started out, which is by studying in Georgia State University and doing a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Georgia. And, and that is, yes, um, of course, stepping back a little bit and I was thinking about myself when I was reading through your bio and how I started off studying something here in Berlin um, that I thought was going to be a good door opener for me, basically, um, having in mind that I knew I wanted to do something political and something international, but really having no idea what. And I was wondering whether it was kind of the same for you, if you chose what you wanted to study um, because you already had a clear career path in mind or just because you were hoping it would be the right sort of setting of scenes for your further career path. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that um, like so many women I know, um, it's it's less about dreaming that one day you're going to grow up to be a fireman or a policeman or, you know, some defined thing and just really beginning the journey by um, exploring what what gives you energy, what you're excited about, what what drives you, what you're interested in. And uh, so when I was in school, um, I love uh, you know, literature and storytelling and um, was really drawn towards 
that, which is how I ended up in journalism school, was, um, you know, I'm really love to hear and understand people's stories around the world. And that's really what I thought I would end up doing was becoming a journalist and, and exploring people's lives that way. Um, and then as I went through school, I also became really interested in the, the creative act of business and like what it takes to create something and make it a business and make something out of it and really thrive. And um, so I, I shifted gears and I ended up going in, getting an MBA. Um, uh, right out of grad school, I went right in, got my MBA and then ended up working for an international company that was doing commodity trading. And, you know, it was sort of one step in front of the other. One thing led to another. I ended up working in banking in New York, which is where I spent most of my adult career, was really as an investment banker, um, working through different areas of banking and um, understanding how finance really um, drives um you know, drives change and, and drives progress. And that's already quite a leap. So I've, of course, I read that part of your bio too, to see, okay, from journalism to investment banking. And, um, and I was wondering, you know, how much a, this having a background in communication, but also of course, a, I'm guessing that a journalism study equips you with a lot of sort of critical thinking and met met methods to apply critical thinking to any kind of job. If that's something that already helped you in your career as an investment banker and, um, and yeah, what from that part of your life were sort of the key learnings that you're still applying today? Yeah. So uh, storytelling and um, I think that the key around that is really um listening is is the most important part of storytelling is you know hearing hearing the stories and then being able to retell them um, starts with listening and I think that empathy and listening really is at the core of everything else and um, you know moving into investment banking what sounds pretty like you know numbers focused and only talking about the analytics and and you know kind of hard hardwired um, actually the work we were doing I was in the energy sector and we were um, building power plants and financing power plants for people um, around the world that didn't have access to energy, needed better access to energy. And um, again, that empathy piece came into the work we were doing because really understanding um, what it means to not have energy or not have enough energy drives the ability to um, raise funds to get people to invest in that. And so really understanding kind of how the story of energy works, how that drives people's lives, how, um, how uh, what the impact of it is and being able to mm. express that is part of building that team then that is going to raise the financing, is going to pull together the project and, and make it all happen. And so it, it, they sound like they're at opposite ends of the spectrum as far as working goes, but they're really, really connected. Um, and in the work I was doing in banking, the other thing that I took away from that that um, really has I've carried with me through my whole life was um, the work we were doing was very project based. It was very much um, pulling together a team of people, surrounding myself with people who knew much more than I did about their specific you know, expertise and bringing in all the best experts to come together to work in a team collaboratively to produce um, the optimal outcome. And that team building and the um, the um, recognition that I, I am not the most important person in this room, I'm not the one who knows everything, but I can be the one who pulls everyone together. And as I've gone on now in Solar Sister and created an organization that is really my role. I, I may be the founder, I may be the CEO, but it's definitely not a hierarchical top-down type arrangement. I think the, the best leaders um, and come from behind and, and kind of, I think of myself being at the bottom of, the, of this organization and that everyone above me, all of my team are the, are the ones that lift us higher. And so it's that real um, kind of inversion of a typical business hierarchy and really understanding that with team building, it's, it's really recognizing and calling on all the talents of the people around you. Yeah, I think that's such a beautiful way of putting it, that you're basically a support structure to everybody else in your organization if you're a good manager. 
rather than putting yourself on top of everyone. Um, allow me one more question about this transition into where you are today and the founding of Solar Systems, because it's struck, so, Solar Sisters, sorry. It struck me that um, the position that you were in financing solutions in the energy sector, of course, is quite a position of power that you had already. So that's also a way of creating impact. So I was wondering what you saw that, caused you to say, no, I'm going to try to create impact in the energy sector in a different way? What was sort of the needs that you identified or the gaps that you saw? Yeah, um, because I was working in power, that gave me a lot of understanding around the need for power and how it changes people's lives. And it makes it sound as if it was like a logical next step to then go start a company that um, is providing power for people. Um, but there was a, an interim step there that um, doesn't really show up, which is I had been working in the energy sector, in banking, in finance for, for quite a while and had um, reached a point in my career where I looked around and um, realized that we were, we were creating, you know, we were building huge power plants. We were putting them in places that didn't have enough power, but the work we were doing um, wasn't socially um, motivated. It wasn't building something kind of good. It was producing something hugely profitable. It was making lots of bankers rich and lawyers rich and, in, you know, um, engineering companies rich and even governments were really benefiting from it. But when you looked at some of the power plants that were being built um, that would be producing, you know, megawatts, and megawatts, and megawatts of power for um, maybe local industry, and up against the walls of that power plant would be a shanty town of people who existed without any access to energy whatsoever. And, and so, you know, it, it's, it, it, there was a real disconnect for me in what we were doing. And in, in investment banking, it became at that time sort of all about the bonus. You know, everybody was like more concerned about the bonus that they were getting rather than the work that they were doing or the impact that they were creating. And that environment um, got to be a point where I was like, I need a more soul satisfying um, work, you know, this was not meeting my needs. And so I decided to take a pause and take a sabbatical from working in banking, thinking that I would take a few years. Um, I had young children at the time. And so I thought I would take a few years and, you know, stay home and be a mom, you know, and, um, and do that work, that important work, which was definitely soul satisfying and probably five times harder which is exactly what I found when I took the break and I stayed home with the kids was um, I loved every minute of it. And I still needed to do something externally where I could be engaged, you know, intellectually and, you know, doing, doing outside of the homework. And so I, I um, got involved with some nonprofit um, organizations and some um, that really spoke to things that I found meaningful around women's empowerment, around the environment, and that was the door that opened up for me to then end up with an organization that was putting solar panels on schools and clinics in Uganda and led me to this um, on the ground epiphany of, you know, the importance of energy access, which I knew and understood at the infrastructure level. And then I was seeing it at the household level and just how important it was and that renewable diversified um, and uh, distributed clean energy could have this incredible person by person impact. And so everything that had come before, which was my team building, my project management, my um, energy, understanding of energy, my storytelling, my empathy, you know, everything that came together sort of in that moment, it was like, I'm in the right place at the right time to, um, to really you know, uh, put myself to work. And that is what becoming an entrepreneur is all about is, you know, you're putting yourself to work towards a cause that you really believe in and um, an outcome that you're then willing to really devote all your energy and resources to. That's fascinating to learn about your stepping stones that got you to <laughs> that inspiration of why Solar Sisters is so badly needed and also this change of perspective, if I understood correctly, from the sort of macro top-down approach of creating energy access to the micro bottom-up grassroots mm -hmm. approach of creating access and 
and opportunities through um, clean energy, which is exactly what Solar Sisters does today. So, um, yeah, you support women entrepreneurs in uh, underprivileged or poor communities to sell affordable solar powered products and fuel efficient cook stoves. And I would say you've created more of a network or a movement than an organization, at least if I understand it works in these different sort of tiers. And I'd love for you just to explain how it works in a nutshell. Yeah, I love that description of it being a movement because I really feel like that captures the energy of it. Um, Solar Sister is a network of independent women entrepreneurs. Solar Sister, the organization, what we do is we recruit, train, and support those women um, to become entrepreneurs, and we provide uh, training and knowledge and access to resources so that their businesses can thrive. Uh, we're focused on what we call the last mile communities, and these are communities in rural, typically rural areas that don't have access to grid electricity. Um, we're working in Nigeria and Tanzania right now and um, in communities where, you know, there's 600 million people in sub-Saharan Africa don't have access to electricity. Um, but with distributable solar and clean energy products, they can, they can have, you know, they can create their own energy access in their own home, not have to wait years and years or generations and generations for the government to extend the grid out to their rural community. And so it, it creates this opportunity for transformational change today rather than waiting for years for it to happen. And Solar Sister um, focuses on women as entrepreneurs, local women, because um, when you look at energy, household energy, women are the managers of household energy. They are the ones in, in these rural communities that are still lighting their homes by um, filling up a small lamp with kerosene and cooking their dinners over an open three stone fire. Um, they're the ones whose labor and, you know, and budget goes towards buying that kerosene or collecting the wood or the charcoal to um, fuel the fire. And so it's really women who are the day to day managers of energy and are making that daily decision about how are they going to fulfill those needs. And so as we looked at the opportunity to really, you know, to have just simple solar light instead of a kerosene light lighting your home. Um, just changes everything. And, you know, it's um, it's safer, it's cleaner, it's better for the environment, it's better for the indoor pollution. It's, um, you know, uh, the women aren't breathing in the fumes, the babies aren't breathing in the fumes, you know, children are able to study at night with a light without the smoke hurting their eyes. Um, you know, they're able to use light in the evening um, for productivity, you know, starting up other businesses or investing. And the, the key here, because from a business perspective, <laughs> Um, you need to, if you're selling a product, solar lamps or solar home systems or clean cook stoves, you need to have a market and they need to be able to afford your product. So the key is that these products are affordable, they're appropriate, they make these huge changes and, and they save money. So the household that was spending maybe two to four dollars per week, simply to buy kerosene, simply to have light for maybe two or three hours in the evening, now can spend, um, you know, solar lamps, the simplest solar lamp cost about $5. And so instead of spending, you know, $5 for kerosene, they can spend that $5 on a solar lamp. And from the point when they own it, it is now free electricity because they just put the lamp out in the morning. It collects the energy from the sun. They bring it in at night. They click it on and they have, you know, hours and hours, not just two to three hours worth of kerosene, but, you know, eight to 12 hours maybe of bright light or even 24 hours worth of, 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 of less bright light. And then there's even the bigger home system. It changes everything just to have the access to energy, really. Yeah. So um, that's where we are trying to give the women in those communities the who are making those choices um, the opportunity to make that better choice for their family. And as you just said, you know, it's so apparent how much of a game changer this is. Um, perhaps you could just quickly run through how you connect the dots. So between the creators, perhaps, of innovative technologies that you're trying to supply to this demography and and the women themselves who might be hard to reach in terms of 
just knowing about you or hearing about you. So again, the sort of network approach that you have to connecting the dots. How does that work? Yeah. yeah. So we operate very much like a local company. So it's our um, local teams who live and work in the communities. Um, our frontline staff are called our business development associates. Um, and they are from the communities that they're working in. They reach out to um, through their social networks and business networks and community networks to find other women, market this opportunity to women in their communities um, who come to this as like, wow, I can see how you know this would be a good opportunity for me to earn some money. I would like to become a solar sister entrepreneur. And so we um, we recruit, you know, and women apply to become entrepreneurs. Once they be once they sign up and they become a solar sister entrepreneur, we provide um, the training and logistical support for their businesses. And that's going to that includes things like the training is kind of a holistic training that includes a very straightforward, practical business skills, um, the technology training so that they understand the products that they're selling um, and how they work and how they benefit people. Um, and. Uh, what we call agency-based training, which is really helping women um, gain the confidence and self-belief and remove some of those obstacles that they put in their own way or culture puts in their way um, to really understand that, yeah, they can be successful businesswomen. They've, they already have what it takes to be a success because what they're bringing to the business, what the women bring to the business is completely, um, you know, is irreplaceable. It's, it's so valuable because what they're bringing is they are building a business in their own communities and they're bringing their energy to it. You know, they're, they're work, working for this and they're bringing their, their networks, their social networks, because the women reach out to their community, you know, through their families and their friends and their second cousins and their church group and their children's school master. And, you know, they have these circles and circles and circles of a social network. And these are, you know, these are actual physical social networks of who they know and, and who knows them and who they can develop relationships with. And it's that social network that is the basis of trust that makes it possible for a woman who um, is living in a community. She has very little experience with technology at all. Um, she's been maybe lighting her home with kerosene for generations. Um, she's been cooking the same way over a fire for generations. For her to make the decision and the choice to, um, to put aside the old ways and to adapt this new technology of solar or an efficient cook stove requires that she really, really trust the person who's bringing her that technology. And so that's why we depend so much. And that's why the strength, the backbone of Solar Sister is the local Solar Sister team and the local network of entrepreneurs. Because once a woman sees another woman using the product and learning from her how she's benefiting from it, then she herself will use it. Whereas yeah. if, um, you know, if I showed up and tried to tell everybody this is, you know, buy solar technology, it, you know, it wouldn't go very far. <laughs> I wouldn't be I'm very not, convincing in that context. Not just that, but it's also, it wouldn't be more sustainable, would it? I think you just explained very well how building those local knowledge structures really makes this a sustainably viable approach because should something, um, yeah, should some further sort of explanation be needed, should something break down, then it, there's a community of people locally that can support each other in getting things to work without relying sort of on some foreign or external entity to do that. So exactly. I'm sure that's very much part of what's making this so effective. Right, that's exactly right. And it really comes back to, it's it's almost, it's more of a movement than a business in that way. Um, you know, even the entrepreneurs and the key to them, um, the sustainability of the entrepreneurs is that they are earning an income, which they then benefit from. You know, it's when you yeah. put you know, income in the hands of women, there's this whole ripple effect of benefits that comes from that. Absolutely. You know, they invest in their children, they invest in their businesses, they invest in their community. But also when you put that income in the hands of women and it changes them and their status within, the, within their family and within their community, and once that happens, you can't take that away. You can't, 
you know, um, you know, they are now changed and, um, and that makes a huge difference. And so it's that, and then that woman becomes the support and the mentor and the role model for another woman. And so it really becomes this kind of viral woman by woman growth of, of clean energy um, in the communities that, as you said, it's a bottom up, it's a grassroots movement as much as it is a, um, you know, a top down distribution network. Yes, I think you've uh, explained it so well. So uh, this is uh, very clear why it's so impactful, both in this sort of network trust snowball system that you've created amongst the women, women entrepreneurs themselves, um, and also in this very holistic approach that you have regarding the different training opportunities and, and knowledge opportunities that come with becoming a solar sister. And so I think that's uh, very clear to follow. What I'm wondering now is if you've already built this sort of movement of women, one woman at a time to sort of create access to clean energy, what does a concept like gender mainstreaming matter to an organization like yours? So is this not inbuilt in the organizational structure you have anyway, or is this still when building an organization, which is then part of this network structure, something that you actively address and think about? Yes, um, both. So when, as you can tell by the name of Solar Sister, um, building in a gender aspect was there from the start. We really, um, you know, Solar Sister was, um, designed because of that key element of for energy access at the household level, women are the customers. And if women are the customers, then we need to bridge that trust gap from in the distribution and um, having women as the distribution network being selling was the best way to build that trust you know, bridge. And so from the very beginning, we knew that because our customers were women, we, need, we wanted the organizational structure to include women. Um, and because particularly in technology and particularly in energy, those are very um, non-women inclusive um, environments that we want, we didn't want to, we went all the way to make it like really, really, you know, in front, in, in the face that this is a woman inclusive, this is a woman um, promoting organization, that we want everybody to know that women are in part of um, energy access, that solar and sister, we want everybody to put in their mind that those two things go together. And so that's why the name was that way. And that's why we built an organization. Also, I'm a woman. So, you know, it, it was founded by and, and led by women. And it's, um, I think, something like 83%, 86% of our entrepreneurs are women. We do have some men, we don't discriminate against them, but it is definitely intentionally, deliberately um, meant to be supportive and inclusive of women. And because of that, it does really focus on women mainstreaming. One of the benefits that of that is at, on the organizations where I am, you know, show up solar sister is a social enterprise. It's a not profit. It's doing, you know, work in energy access, which has a lot of, um, which has, you know, gaining, um, movement across the world of, of renewable energy. And when I am present at the table or, you know, around the table, maybe at the UN or at sustainable energy for all, or at some of these other events, I'm often, you know, one of the few women at the table, maybe the only woman at the table. And the fact that not only am I a woman at the table, but when I'm introduced or what my name card says is solar sister, it just helps reinforce that, yes, women belong at this table. And here we are. I have so many questions, sorry, I'm just making a note of what you just said, and I, I'm, I've seen your question in the chat, uh, Alem, I'm going to ask it in a second, uh, maybe just very quickly, the uh, hashtag asking for a friend, because it's kind of the same in my <laughs> NGO, um, if you have a women-led NGO, then do you sometimes also really take care to see, okay, men are also included, like you just said, you don't exclude men. Um, to keep some kind of also gender equality within the organization, or is that less of a focus really because of your very, yeah, just the core mission of your organization? It, it is important. It is a focus. And we want to make sure that, you know, um, we've had to kind of do the reverse inclusion of most organizations, like on our board, we had to be, it, it did 
tend towards and it trended toward a point where we had all women on the board. And we very deliberately reached out and um, brought some men onto our board because we didn't want it to be just like a girls club. That's not the point. Um, you know, we don't want a pink ghetto of, you know, women doing good things for women. And, you know, that can, that can, um, that would be the opposite of mainstreaming. So mainstreaming means we want to build a more inclusive society, a more inclusive business world, um, not two separate business worlds. And so, yeah, I do think it's just as important as, um, you know, organizations that are traditionally men led, men founded, men financed, men you know, <laughs> staffed and everything like that, they're going to have to learn to look at the world and, and include women into that. Um, we have to be really careful that we don't fall into the same trap and, you know, just make this like pink sandbox over here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, I have, we had pretty much the same experience. We have our first man on the board now because we also realized that it might be a good idea for different reasons, including that men, of course, need to be advocates of our work as much as women in order to really have this be a, a societal change um, that we need reaching, yeah, everybody involved in the society. So, um, Alam asked earlier, this is just a thing, very concrete, concrete question. And please, um, Alam, also feel free to bring yourself into the conversation. I'll be opening the floor for your questions and comments in just a minute. Uh, but there was the question, um, if you're supporting female entrepreneurs working off grid in rural area of Ethiopia. So we're currently working in Tanzania and Nigeria. Um, we are expanding this year. We're looking very we're very excited. Um, we'll be expanding into Kenya. And um, we hope over the next few years to expand our work into other, you know, across Sub-Saharan Africa, where the energy access need and um, is so great that um, a local network of women entrepreneurs, you know, we have shown is a really, um, you know, concrete and practical solution on the ground. So, um, we're looking to expand our network, we're looking to expand the organization, and we're also looking to expand through partnerships so that um, this is a huge global problem and we're not going to ever be big enough to solve it all by ourselves. And so one of the ways that we can really address the issue of energy access and renewable energies, you know, and climate change, and you know, <laughs> these are big issues. And so we're not gonna do it by ourselves. So we really do need to, um, work with partners and you know we're very interested in finding partners who maybe are already on the ground that we could work with and partner to help them develop solar sister methodologies that would work for them so maybe we can um say that alan um if you like then we are happy to establish contact also outside of this conversation to see how there can be some collaboration perhaps to um, open the doors also in Ethiopia. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, and I'll bring in your next question because it fits very well right now. Do you have any concrete criteria, sorry, criteria whilst you're selecting the next countries that you're looking to scale in and whilst you're selecting your partners? Yeah, so um, we do. So we developed um, with support from the Miller Center, which is a social enterprise um, an organization that supports social enterprises. And we worked with them on our scale out strategy to really take a look so that we can be um, really thoughtful about how we would scale. We're, we're a small organization doing big, mighty things. And so we have to be a little careful about how we create that leveraging. And um, so we worked with them and um, created criteria for how, how do we look at like, where would we want to go next geographically? How would we um, develop uh, a decision-making criteria to help guide us as well as um, what data do we need to help drive that? I mean, it, big picture level is, you know, do they have um, high degree of energy poverty? Is it a, a population that is suffering from that? If yes, then that's, you know, one of the gates that would go through then, you know, um, how big is it? How how easy would it be for us to establish a presence there um, um, as a business, as a social enterprise, as a nonprofit? How would we set up registration and all that kind of technical stuff? So it goes through this whole matrix of decision making. And then the biggest question on that sheet is really who would we work with as a partner? 
um, everywhere that we've been really successful. We have had really incredible partners that we work with. We're an on the ground practitioner. So we are the ones who um, recruit, train and support the entrepreneurs, but we have supply chains. So the products we don't design or um, manufacture any of our products. So we have um, you know, supply partners, we have um, partnerships with other local organizations working in communities that really help us um, entry into those communities. And so the partnerships on the ground are, are probably our biggest criteria is, you know, who is the partner and is there an alignment in values and um, mission? Thank you for elaborating on that. So there's more questions coming in. I definitely want to open the floor. So maybe this is a good point in time. If you do have a question and a comment and you would like to direct it uh, yourself to Catherine, then please feel free to come in with your audio and video. Barbara, I'm wondering if you'd like to do that with a question that you just asked in the chat. Obviously, the offer stands. If you don't want to be part of the recording, I'm happy to read out your question for you. So I'm not sure if everybody's able to in, enabled to switch on their cameras and their audio devices. Mm, if you are, please feel free to use the little raise hand sign to let me know if you'd like to make an intervention. And you're welcome to do so for the rest of the event from now on. Mm, but of course, I'd be happy to read out your questions, like I just said, as well. So. I'll read out Barbara's question and then I'll hand it over to you, Fenley. I hope that's OK in that order. So um, Barbara wrote. What policy partners are you connected to if one understands gender mainstreaming as a strategy towards realizing gender equality that involves integration of gender perspectives into the preparation, design and implementation, monitoring and evaluation of policies, regulatory measures and spending programs with a view to promoting equality between women and men and combating discrimination? Can you put yourself into a context here in a bit more detail? Sure. So um, to give you a sense, Solar Sister is very much a practitioner social enterprise. So we are on the ground um, doing, you know, the recruit, train, support women entrepreneurs, building up this network of distribution of clean energy products. And that is our, our main um, work that we do. That's the work that we do. Because of that, we are also um, like living examples and uh, kind of a living laboratory for gender mainstreaming and for um, making, you know, really passionate about bringing women into the technology sector, the energy sector, you know, entrepreneurship, um, you know, making, opening up the doors and removing the obstacles so that women are um, able to really fulfill their, their potential in those, in those spheres. In order to do that policy at the government level, policy at, um, you know, um, corporate level is incredibly important. And so I think our biggest work there is being an example of what it looks like when women are able to be part of entrepreneurship, when women are able to be active in energy access industry, when women are able to be really on the ground and have those obstacles removed and have their potential realized. We do policy work mostly through other better policy workers that people like we're a part of um, Sustainable Energy for All and Go Glow, which is the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association, and Power Africa, and um, Energia, which is a you know women in energy um, actor. And so, you know, we we support and work with them. But I would say that um, this is part of you know pulling a team around you who's better than you are. You know, we are not you know we don't have sort of a policy team on our own that is um, producing white papers and things like that. We're we're really much more focused on the, the practical side. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't make it to unmute myself in time. <laughs> uh, thanks for the answer, because that was a sort of a, a sorting criteria I still missed in everything you explained, but congrats to your uh, on your uh, approach that you do. And I think you're building your uh, supply chain the right way when you put the policy work to somebody else who has much more 
experience and training in that. And again, you can play back examples anytime to that political level or policy work. Mm -hmm. Others only do policy work and you always ask yourselves where they are really leading up to with their, with their projects. So thank you for that. Thank you also for the question, Barbara. And I also think it's a very good example of why it's so important to work in network structures as a, a social environmental movement, because we all need to sort of share the resources and capacities we have. So uh, thanks for sharing that. Fenli, over to you. Yeah, and thank you, presenter. And thank you, Katharina. And I come from China, Beijing. Here it is Binai, but I, but I would like to join this meeting. Yeah, and I would like to ask Katharina one question. Um, several years ago, I come to visit a World Bank project um, to support the cleaner energy in Western China in village to helping the women to using the clean energy substitute to um, burning the wood will make the pollution. However, I found it is not only the technical issue. Um, so I think it will be more um, focused on the social um, behavior and the social uh, problem. Um, Maybe after one or two months, and um, the women uh, will be uh, go back to their traditional behavior, not using mm -hmm. the clean energy, something like that. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask, um, could, could you please tell me how to make this um, take a cleaner energy and uh, more sustainable to maintain the long term shift? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I think um, exactly what you speak of, we have seen actually time and again, especially with the cook stoves, where um, yeah. uh, efficient cook stoves are developed and are taken and you know given to women and say, hey, here's, here's a cook stove that's much more efficient than what you're using now. And the women might try it for a little while, but then they revert back to their traditional cooking. And I think, as you said, it's it's not just a technical issue. It's a social issue. It's a cultural issue. It's an emotional issue. It's, you know, when you're talking about how you cook your food, um, you know, women are the home caregivers. Traditionally, women are the ones who cook dinner and uh, lunch and, you know, feed their families. And the way that they learned how to cook was passed down to them from their mother. And you know, they'll pass down to their daughter and um, just telling somebody that this stove is more efficient than that one, when it might have a completely different methodology of cooking is not going to be enough. You can't just rely on efficiency to make that change. And I think that's part of why having women part of the distribution network, having women part of the design network, having women having human centered design that includes the women's inputs when you're um, designing the stoves. Um, so for example, in um, in uh, Nigeria, where there's, um, a, a, you know, one of the things they eat is cassava, which has to be kind of beaten in order to be edible. And so when they cook, when they're cooking it, they have these long, long um, sticks that the whole time it's cooking, they're also like, banging it and <laughs> they're kind of like beating it like mashing it the whole time well um you know an efficient cook stove that is brought in completely falls apart in three days because it's not it wasn't built for that level of um you know interaction whereas if they understood from the women like what is it you cook how do you cook it what do you need um another example was in you know then then the stove could be designed for their needs rather than like design should meet the people's needs, not the other way around. People don't shouldn't meet the needs of the design. And I think that's one of the problems is if you don't have women incorporated in every step of the way, um, you're not going to have their needs incorporated either. Okay, thank you, Katharina. 
Thank you so much for raising this question, Fendi, and thank you so much for staying up so late to be part of our event. It's lovely to have you. Um, you should now all be able to switch on your camera and your audio, so do please raise your hands or just switch on your camera and give me a little wave if you'd like to direct a question or comment at Catherine. And I see more hands come up, so passing it over to Nadia next. Oh, Nadia, you still need to unmute yourself, please. Sorry. Perfect. Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know how many times we connect and we always forget. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm based in uh, in Normandy, uh, just outside Paris, and um, I just would like to rebounce on um, the uh, previous lady. I worked in Africa uh, on um, capacity building and um, local content in country value programs uh, for uh, in the energy sector. And um, obviously, you know, the, all the renewable was of very much of interest. And uh, I met a lot of NGOs and um, uh, people that had amazing, you know, uh, uh, how do you say, initiatives and programs. And one of them was a chap that um, invented, while he was in Africa, a solar um, oven, you know, to uh, cook bread and pizza and that sort of things. And um, he started with a small piece and then, you know, uh, made bigger ones, including, you know, roasting seeds and grains and, you know, um, and he tried to um, sell, you know, the, uh, uh, the oven, you know, and the uh, concept or whatever, the invention. And he really had a hard time when he got back to France. He's actually based in Normandy. Uh, next to Rouen, and amazingly enough, um, he grow. He managed to get, you know, money, and uh, he's got many ovens. So he he does bake, you know, bread, and in the villages, you know, around, he delivers everything by bike. So it's zero, you know, almost uh, pollution and particles and you know, etc. So. Uh, and he's trying, you know, uh, desperately to sell his invention or, uh, or his, you know, um, um, what he has, you know, uh, fabricated. He gets orders, but mainly from France and from Europe. And uh, but he hasn't been able to expand. So just wanted to give you that insight. You know, there are people that have plenty of. Uh, and funnily enough, you know, his concept and uh, his. Uh, it's you know uh, I've seen you know I've seen it and it works pretty well, but that's the difficulty and uh, and you know that he's in, you know uh, uh, encountering and um, just another thing that I wanted to say as an example um, he's um, he's part of a, a sort of a green you know circle of people and uh, other producers farmers etc. So they have changed the mentalities and the way to consume, produce, you know, et cetera. And it takes time, you know, to set up. But, you know, uh, in that part of Normandy, it's working quite well. But obviously, you know, it's a bit disruptive. You know, people stick to, usually stick to their, you know, habits. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those examples, Nadia. Would you like to comment, Catherine? Um, I think one of the really exciting opportunities for for our entrepreneurs, and as 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 uh, Nadia mentioned, for entrepreneurs over the all all over the world, really is using renewable energy for productive use. And so, you know, it's more than just lighting your home, and it's more than just cooking over your you know cooking your dinner, but using renewable energy as the source for powering up local um, enterprise is is a huge opportunity and will really um i think is really the next the next big opportunity for for people i'm gonna do final check maybe a last call for questions to catherine i think we have space for one or two left um and i'll already ask one to sort of sort of see what what else can we tap your brains for in the session that we have here for today in terms of getting a bit advice? Because I think you've already shared a lot of really great advice with our 
audience today, but um, yeah, are there general points of advice for others building their organizations in terms how to use this tool of gender mainstreaming and apply it? And yeah, what are the sort of key things you would look out for? Yeah, um, I think applying a gender lens to what you're doing and really um, looking at the work that you do and what you're trying to do, um, kind of go back to the start and design it with that gender lens. And what I mean by that is um, maybe I can best illustrate with an example, another organization that does similar to what Solar Sister does. If you define the work that we do is being distributing clean energy into rural communities in Africa. Solar Sister has a uniquely uh, women centered network of distributors. Um, and the other organization has a more traditional sales agent, probably 90% men sales agents. And um, as an organization, they were trying to, they reached out and they said, we're really trying to, um, you know, hire more women. We're, we're, we want to, you know, bring more women into this opportunity, um, but we aren't successful. We're not able to do that. We see that you have so many women entrepreneurs, you know, what is it that you're doing that we're not doing? And so we, um, they described the job description for their sales agent. And they said, well, our sales agent um, covers a territory of, you know, this much, and they have to be able to travel from village to village to village over a week's time, because in each village, they're going to make sales. So over a week, they're going to go from one village to the next, driving their motorcycle from one village to the next, and, and then, you know, return back at the end of the week, sort of like your, your typical traveling salesman kind of job description. And, and if you look at that with a gender lens, you can readily see there are not women who are going to be able, or not very many women, who are going to be able to apply for that job because women, in addition to wanting to work and earn income for their families, are also responsible for getting their children to school and um, feeding the chickens and making the dinner and, um, you know, <laughs> cleaning up at the end of the day and tucking one, everyone back in bed. And, you know, women tend to have, you know, the double life of even if you are employed and working outside the home, you have a whole other job back at home. And so in looking at that sales agent job that they were describing, the design of the job itself prevented them from having women applicants. Um, Whereas when you look at the Solar Sister sales agent, what we've done is we've um, handed the design of her daily work day over to her. So the women are able to um, sell as little or as much as they want to. They're able to do it at, you know, four in the afternoon after the you know, after they brought the cows home, but before they fix the dinner, or they're able to do it on Sunday afternoon after church when they're, you know, amongst all, everyone that they've been to church with, and they have this ready-made um, community of customers, or they're able to do it from, you know, eight in the morning to six every day because they run a kiosk on the corner of their home, or, you know, they, you know, they get to decide what works for them rather than us prescribing, here's, here's how you have to fit our job we're able to turn it into an opportunity that says, here's how our job can fit you. And so I think, um, you know, looking at making things available for women, you really have to um, like kind of break it down and get humble and get like, think from the start, like so many, so many assumptions that we already make, they, you have to unlearn, maybe that's what I'm talking yeah. about. You have to unlearn a lot about what you already think work looks like you know, success looks like um, so that you can start fresh. Yeah. And and also, I think that's that's a learning like what do you have as a blueprint that's sort of, you know, the this is how organization works. This is how we operate. These are our values. Like what are the non-movables and where do you leave the freedoms for people to interpret those as you just explained, which is why this is a system of 
entrepreneurs working together and not a franchise that you're uh, putting out in other places. Mm -hmm. um, Alam asked, and and our colleagues have been kind to already share some links in the chat to numbers that they can read up on Solar Sisters Impact. But is there anything that you want to highlight as in like, you know, the successes you're really proud of, the numbers of the sure. women that you've reached and just the momentum of this movement as we've, as we've coined it today to close with? Yeah, so um, Solar Sister has supported over 6,800 women entrepreneurs to start their businesses. And those businesses have reached um, over 3 million people with clean energy access. That's amazing. Congratulations, Catherine, to the amazing work you've done. And I really think we're starting to see the change. Like this is a bit anecdotal, but I just attended, I had another event today, which was a startup pitch event in the future of mobility sector. And the startup that won was the most sustainable, producing locally, the one which had gender equality in their team and was female led and the only female pitch presenter as well. So I left that event. Oh, thinking, that's so exciting. I'm so good. glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And this is also where we see sort of change take hold because there was no focus on women entrepreneurship or sustainability, but that's the um, the company that took the prize away. And I think this is where we can see this sort of change mainstreaming really across different um, right. different ways. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's, been such that's my dream is when, when we no longer have to talk about, oh, you're a woman founder or, oh, you're a woman entrepreneur or this is a woman's business. You know, when, when the fact that it's a woman's business is, it's a business, it's a successful business. And, um, you know, that the the, um, the piece about identifying it as it's a woman's business is no longer necessary because it's just, of course. Absolutely. That's exactly what we're heading for. And with that, I would like to invite everybody to switch on the cameras for a group picture that we would like to take today. So if you'd like to be part of the group picture, then please switch on your cameras. That would be most lovely. And I'd also like to let you know that we've posted the link to the questionnaire. We're so grateful for your feedback so that we can make sure these events really fit your agenda and your interests. So if you'd be so kind and give us some feedback for today, that would be most welcome. Welcome. I don't know if somebody's going to say cheese and press go. <laughs> I'd like to say thank you so much for Catherine uh, to be here today and share all her insights, but also to all of you. I really enjoy our event so much to see you sharing in the chat, you asking your questions and bringing examples from your work, because I feel this is also really part of the networking and momentum that Women Energize Women is trying to achieve and you're helping achieve that with your presence. So that's wonderful. And so I want to just close with letting you know that our next event is coming up on March 28th. And um, that time, the next time, it's going to be um, sharing different pre best practice examples, also in gender mainstreaming, but looking at really different also parts of the world to see how it's taking hold in different contexts and cultures. And of course, to also create more synergies between the speakers and yourselves attending. The event is going to take place as part of the BETD, so Berlin Energy and Transition Days uh, 2022 and will be a side event of the Berlin Energy Week in cooperation with GWNet, Global Women's Network, and the energy transition. I really hope that you're all going to be there. And in the meanwhile, follow us via the different social media channels that we have with our hashtag Women Energize. And of course, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and on YouTube, of course, we also always post information about the upcoming events on our website. And yes, um, looking forward very much to hopefully seeing you all in March for our next event. So with that, I'd like to thank you all so much for being part of today's event and hope you have a lovely afternoon, evening, night, depending on where you're tuning in from today. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. It's been such thank a pleasure. You. All right. Thanks again, thank Catherine. You. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.